Yeah, I mean, look, let's maybe chat about how we're both basically reformed little punks who almost screwed up our lives, but instead are in the incredibly fortunate position to be doing this podcast and writing best-selling books for a living, or at least one of us is doing that. <laughs> sure. Let's, let's yeah. get into it. Yeah. Let's, look, let, let's I, make this the, the, how did, how did we almost fuck up our lives episode? How about that? <laughs> it's true. It's true though, because I, man, we got in a lot of trouble when we were younger and you know, we both fell into that. We don't have to go down this road too far, but into that like pickup artist subculture thing for a while. And I know you got out of it some time, quite a bit of time, a few years before you wrote subtle art. And I had, I had spent years trying to be like the good white hat version of the dating and pickup thing. And it's at some point you're just like the, the meth dealer that doesn't stab people. And you're like, no, 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 I'm a good guy. And you realize you're heading headlong into trouble because, and I think now everybody sees these red pill guys who are like women are evil and they only care about your money. And all of these people are in one bucket. And it was the stuff you and I were working on, the, the men's self-help, which later became just self-help and personal growth stuff. I hate the word self-help. It became kind of impossible to to separate from all of the yucky stuff that was going on, both from the red pill men's rights side and the like bullshit side where people were just making up things like manifest your dreams by thinking about it hard enough. I don't know. What do you th what do you think about that? That was a, that was a terrible question. I'm going to let you <laughs> run with that. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't even a question. Oh, the beauty about terrible questions, Jordan, is that I, I get to just say whatever I I want, and it's you know it's never my fault. So, um, no, I I will say it's been interesting, you know, seeing all the the Andrew Tate stuff the last year or so, like because yeah, you and I came from that world, and there was a lot of pissed off, confused young men, and I feel like a the majority of those men, including ourselves, kind of grew out of that and kind of figured their shit out and realized like, oh, this is how you become a healthy, mature human being. And and the 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 minority who never really figured it out kind of just went away. But now we're 10 years later and it's it's like resurfaced again. And I, I don't know if it's like a new generation of young guys, but and maybe this is like a cyclical thing that that mm -hmm keeps happening and and we were just one of those cycles but um it it's been a little bit frustrating you know a lot of my readers like young male readers have been sending me some of like andrew tate stuff and asking me what i think about it or to comment on it and it's it's just deja vu it's like man i thought i thought we went through this in 2009 like i thought this was yeah. settled i thought we figured <laughs> this out that this is yeah. this fucking hateful spiteful sexist shit is like not very helpful uh to young guys so it's it's been a little bit saddening to um to see it resurface in this way it's it's interesting you mentioned cycles cuz i i i've been thinking about this too cuz of course people are like when are you going to interview andrew tate and i'm at first it was like never and now I'm like I will do it if I can get him to cut the cut the crap Right and and that's is that possible? I don't know We have a bunch of mutual friends and I'm like guys Can I get him to cut the crap and they're like well he's in prison right now, so put a pin in that Let's let let's let the the Romanian police and the you know the in, Interpol like have their way with them first <laughs> Yeah, I, I, look at this at the same time. There's so many people that are like He's so different in person, which makes me interested in talking with somebody like that, because it, that would be like finding out that Alex Jones is just a normal dude behind closed doors. He's not, by the way, you know, the conspiracy guy. He's totally not. But it, it's, it makes it even more of a, of a crazy phenomenon because you're like, OK, so what part of this do you believe and what part of this is, is shtick to get clicks? Do you remember Tom Likas? Remember that guy, the radio host? And he I would be know. like, so he was around our time. Uh, even before and he had this show where he'd be like what are you wearing when women would call in and he was just like a horrible misogynist he took all of the stuff that Howard Stern did in terms of like dating and, and bad advice and turned it up to 11 and guys would call in and be like I want to get my ex-girlfriend to realize she's made a mistake and he'd be like go bang all of her friends all of them you know and like get them really drunk and take he was just give like terrible terrible horrible advice and people some people really believed it but most people were kind of like yeah it's entertaining stupid stuff for stupid guys we're kind of back there again 
with a yep. lot of these red pill dudes who are like women, this and that. And it's like, God, the chip on your, sh you must have back problems from the size of the, sh of the chip that is on your shoulder 24 <laughs> seven. And these guys are writing books and it's like, it, it's just, yeah, you're right. It's disheartening. It's like, didn't we cover this? Didn't you cover this? Didn't I cover this in my old company where we said, this is bad for you. And, and all of these guys who went through this, some of the other dating instructors for like other companies, I don't want to mention names, that came up around the same time as you and I, they left and they were like, oh man, that stuff was toxic. Woo, I am glad that I outgrew that. That was ruining my life. And they just kind of went and got a job. And, and now you end up with like the selection bias of guys that are still doing this at age 40 and are really, really negative because in part they're still doing this at age 40. Yeah, well, it's, I think the only, like, if anybody who has a, a semblance of emotional health uh, gets out because they realize how toxic it is. And so, yeah, they, you, you get kind of like this, like you said, a self selection effect that the only guys who are still there after two decades are the angry ones. I want to go back to the thing you said about Tate, though. Like, I, I, have, I have found this interesting thing, and I've seen this come up with a lot of people at this point where it's like, it's like, oh, he just says that stuff to get attention. He's not really like that, you know, and, and there's like there's basically two you, you get these public these controversial public figures and there are competing theories that people have about him, which is either a it's all an act just to, to get attention and get clicks and haha, you're not in on it or B, they're actually a, a terrible person. And I I don't see how that's a defense of somebody. Like I don't know I agree. what's worse, right? Like, like it, does it matter? Like, like it like if you if you did go hang out with Alex Jones and he was like, "Oh yeah, I, I just make all this shit up." You know, it just it gets the listeners fired up. It's worse. It's worse. Like that's yeah. that's that's <laughs> actually worse. more that's more yeah. evil than just being a fucking crazy person. So right. it's I I don't see how that's a defense of somebody. I I think it's uh you're saying like, oh, no, this person who doesn't realize they're evil actually realizes it. They're just doing it because it's funny. You know, it, right. it, it, it's it's so much worse, actually, now that you phrase it that way. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, if you met somebody, if you met somebody and they were delusional and, and that's why they thought that the Jews were reptile people, because they literally they had a, a brain disorder and th they that was a thing that they believed and they could get medicated and they'd go, oh, my gosh, that was terrible. I can't believe I believe that. Or they go, you know what? I just don't care about other people. I made that up. Do you know how many people I've made hate Jews because of my reptile people lies? Ah, what rubes way worse than somebody who's suffering from a mental illness, even if it makes them a piece of crap in terms of their behavior. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. And I think that that you're right. It's kind of lost. Like, hey, you're just not in on the joke. And I'm like the joke of making a bunch of really vulnerable young men uh, believe something that's horrible and definitely not going to serve them at all through the next however many years they believe this possibly lead them to do and say and believe really horrible things about themselves and other people. That's not a really funny joke. That's not a good gag. Right. Yeah. And, and it, especially because it's monetized. The whole point is it's monetized or whatever the equivalent term is for fame, right? That's all it's for. Yeah. And it's, it, it, and again, like this is kind of what happened to, this is kind of what killed the pickup artist industry. It's, I mean, it was already declining, but around 2011, 2012, you had the Elliot Rogers shooting. You had a number of high profile awful, awful things that happened, like really, really troubled young men who went out and did heinous shit. And, and it came out that they were part of that community and had been reading a bunch of these books and like paying for seminars and stuff. And it's like, that's, that's what ends up happening. And I, I feel like, I mean, it may turn out that Tate is the person who, who did the heinous shit this time around. But, uh, you know, even if it, even if it, the charges to him, you know, it turns out that they're false. At some point, there's going to be some tr troubled young guy somewhere who takes it way too seriously and does something fucked up. And, you know, we just we go through the cycle again. Yeah, you're 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 right here. Elliot Rogers, for people who don't know, and I'm going to get the details wrong because I'm going off memory here. But he was a guy who believed that he was entitled to sex with women. Other guys were, who were less than him were not. And he, I think he took a machete and killed like nine people. It he was, killed it was his gross. He killed his, yeah, he had, he had all these really fucked up 
like videos about how women had wronged him by not showing him any romantic interest. Uh, and then, yeah, he like macheted his roommates, which were male. And then he took a gun and went like to a bunch of sorority houses and started shooting them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. I mean, clearly he was disturbed. I, you know, I, I don't want to be like, oh, pickup artist leads to people murdering people. Because most guys, I, I would say many, I sh we can't even say most because I don't have stats and, and probably nobody does. I'm sure nobody does. Many of the guys who came through those programs would come through and go, okay, I feel more confident. That was helpful. I could probably leave some of the gross misogynist crap aside. Some of them are young and they learned stuff about body language and nonverbal communication. And some places were better than others and some instructors were better than others. And I'd like to think that many men are smart enough to throw out the bathwater to butcher the metaphor here and be like, okay, I learned a lot about this stuff. It got me interested in people and human behavior and it made me look introspectively at myself. That was good. Maybe I don't need to make up lies about how I drive a Ferrari and then target women as objects. Maybe I can outgrow that. I'd ho I'd like to think many guys went through that successfully. I will, and I mean, I can speak from my experience, you know, meeting and dealing with hundreds of guys back then. I, I would say easily 90, at least 95% of them were really good dudes who just had bad social skills or, uh, you know, were bullied when they grew up. So they had a lot of insecurities, a lot of issues. Like most of them were just really good guys who were a little bit nerdy or whatever and needed a little bit of like, they were confused. They didn't know where else to go. Um, and I feel like part of, you know, what, what part of my transition out of that industry is what I realized was I was like, you know, we have this fucked up industry because it is not socially acceptable for men to talk about improving their social and emotional lives. And so I kind of re rededicated myself of like, okay, fuck the dating thing. Forget the, the pickup thing. Let's just try to take men and teach them, like make it okay for them to be healthy. And so a lot of what started my career, you know, the F-bombs, the humor, the ridiculous stories and anecdotes, a lot of that was because that's what young men responded to. And it was, I remember going into my first publisher meetings for Subtle Art and they would ask me if I knew the demographics of my, my blog audience. And I said, yeah, it's, you know, it's like 55% women, 45% men. Really? And, and they were shocked. They were actually astounded. Yeah. They, they were like, we never see self-help books with more than 20% men. Like never, it never happens. Oh, really? Uh, I thought it, I thought you were going to say 90% men because this is how I write and it's about men stuff. That's interesting. This is the opposite of what I thought then. Yeah, we know the publishers were blown away. They were like, because, and I think one of the reasons Subtle Art was as successful as it was, was it was the, the first, um, it was one of the first self-help books that drew in a large male audience. A lot of my thinking and, and kind of strategizing when I first transitioned into the self-help world was like, you know, if we can, if we can make, if I can find a way to make these self-help topics appealing for, for young men, then they won't, then most of these guys won't feel like they have to go to a pickup artist industry or yeah. to an Andrew Tate or, or whatever. I like that because that, in fact, that was one of the, the initial sort of germinating seeds of the reason I split off from my old company, which was purely dating focused in many ways, because I wanted the podcast that, which now is the Jordan Harbinger show, or which became the Jordan Harbinger show. I wanted that to supplant or, or yeah, supplant the training that we were offering. And I liked some of the training that we were doing, of course, don't get me wrong, but I thought, you know, if people really do the deep work and, and really look at themselves and really focus on, their career and learning skills and then developing out these social, they don't kind they don't need the bells and whistles. They could come for the bells and whistles, but it's no longer, I, I almost wanted that to like not be the business anymore because I thought we don't really need most of these clients. Some of them need therapy and shouldn't be here. Like they need actual <laughs> psychological help. And then so true. The, the rest of them or, or a certain portion of the rest of them 
they come, they came here to like meet us and do stuff. But I'm like, they could they could have just gone in this other direction. And then there's like five percent, ten percent where we're like, this person really doesn't even need to be here at all. They're just getting like this little sprinkle of skill on top of a really healthy personality. And those were always the most fun and best clients. And I thought, what if we could just teach those guys? And then I did the math and I was like, I would run three workshops a year and live on my mom's couch. And then I thought, okay, <laughs> but, but that's kind of, that's better that way, right? You know, if you can write yeah. subtle art and, and the rest of your book models and other books that you have, which will link in the show notes, and, and then you don't have to have people trying to hire you to take them out for drinks four to seven nights a week, you know, and, and go out every night and try and pick up women to generate confidence, self-esteem and social skills. That would be, that's an ideal outcome. And I think, I think you and I kind of both came to that conclusion. And by the way, before I forget, I, I have to tell this anecdote because a long time ago, you and I were catching up on the phone about something and you said, I'm working on a book. And I said, great. I don't know how we got to the title, but we did. And you said, it's the subtle art of not giving a fuck. And I remember hanging up the phone and going to my wife and going, so my friend's writing a book and the title is The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And I feel like I should tell him that that is a terrible title and no one is going to buy it. And, <laughs> and she's like, I don't know. <laughs> she's like, I don't know. Like he probably tested it or, you know, maybe has some data behind these ideas. And I was like, but I really don't want my friend to fail because of something stupid like this title. What do I do? And she talked me out of having like an intervention with you about it, and, which wouldn't have worked anyway. It's not like I would have successfully talked you out of that, hopefully. <laughs> but it's so funny because if, if people don't know how many, it's like the best selling book of the, our generation. Or at least it, it's one of it's, it's it sold how many millions of absurd. copies? Yeah. Tell it's me, absurd. no, tell me like how, bra brag for a second. Cause it's ridiculous how wrong I was. It's like obscenely, Stupid how uh, wrong I was. Globally, I think 15 or 16 million, somewhere around yeah. there. Yeah. So th think <laughs> this is why I this is why my show is called the Jordan Harbinger show, because I'm obviously terrible at coming up with creative titles <laughs> and names. <laughs> coming up with titles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like just I'm just gonna not quit my day job when it comes to naming things or coming I'm, up with I'm, if I think a title is clever, run away from that title. I'm I'm excited if you if you ever do a book it should just be called the Jordan Harbinger book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. People be like why didn't you name it something more more with more pizzazz? I that's I clearly do not have the the magic touch. Cuz this is so what fun. it is. It's the Jordan Harbinger yeah. book. You know, it's that's what you're getting. <laughs> that's what you get, man. Yeah, speaking of uh you got a movie now. I I enjoyed the movie. Of course I read the book. It's not just the same the exact same stuff or delivered in this, you know it's a different way. And you went viral recently because K Katie Porter was reading it on the House floor during this insane McCarthy vote drama, which is really good timing. I mean, everyone's erupting around her, and she's reading the subtle art of not giving a fuck. I assume you saw a little spike from that. That had to help. Oh yeah, yeah. That 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 was a nice. It, it was a, a very well timed uh, spike of un unplanned publicity. I think uh, everybody, everybody, not not just me, but people at Universal, people at Harper Collins, everybody was you know, doing a little rain dance in their office when they saw that. Yeah, viral, viral photo that I'm sure millions of people saw. It kind of, and it's like, wait, did you, did you send her this? Do you know her? Because the timing was so good. And it's like when uh, Chris, was it Chris Hemsworth held up your yeah. book in a video on Facebook? And I was like, dude, how much did you pay for that? And you're like, I don't think you can buy that. I'm pretty sure, <laughs> pretty sure <laughs> companies pay him out. millions. Of, yeah, like they pay him yeah. millions of dollars to show up wearing like a boss suit and a watch. And he's doing a video for you saying, this is a great book. You got to buy it. You don't have enough money. Yeah. That, I mean, dude, if that. I could buy a congressman that easily, that, you know, the, that would say a lot about our politics. Just yeah, ask I had, Putin. I had no He'll idea. tell you how to buy a congressman. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Speaking of which, uh, coincidentally, my books were just censored in, in Russia by Putin. The, the cover or the whole book? Uh, so the, both books have anecdotes about the Soviet Union ah. and and they're like blanked out. And so about a week ago, um, I actually heard, so this is completely random, uh, a little bit of a tangent, but uh, like two years ago, of all people, Gary Kasparov reached out to me oh, nice. and he was like, he was like, Hey, your books are about to be censored in Russia. And I was like, what the fuck? First of all, How do you holy know? shit it. I was like, yeah. first of all, holy, holy shit, it's Gary Kasparov. And, uh, and second of all, like, wait, <laughs> how do you know this? Where is this coming from? And you Gary know, Kasparov, chess grandmaster, uh, famously 
played IBM's big blue computer and is also a political activist, just a very famous chess personality who's transcended that. Yeah, but yeah just so people, he's you know, uh, arguably the best chess player ever, was also the number one dissident against Putin's government in the early 2000s, was the only person to run for prime minister against Putin and then was actually kicked out of the country, exiled mm -hmm. for it. Uh, this was all like mid 2000s. Anyway, so I was like, okay, that's kind of wild, whatever. But um, yeah, about a, about a week ago, I started getting a lot of a lot of messages from Russian readers with like pictures of entire pages, just like you know, how, like the CIA like blacks out documents. Yeah, redact. Yeah, yeah, like, that's that's what they did. They didn't even bother like editing. They just there's just pages where it's like half the words are redacted. That's so weird. I heard about that from another author whose name, I can't remember exactly what this book was. It was about, it was something that had to do with not China directly, but they mentioned China in the book. And so they just deleted the sentences. So they're not even whited out so that you know something was moved. They're just erased. So people would write and go, this paragraph makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's missing four sentences that mention, and it was anything that mentioned China. It wasn't just like, oh, we got to edit out the Xi Jinping yeah. thing, but leave in the other China. They just deleted, they like did control F for China and deleted every sentence with that word in it once they found out there was offending content. And that's how they censored this book. I wish I could remember who I, who I was just talking about this a couple weeks ago. That was the, the author. And it wasn't, again, not even a book on China. So they, that's so interesting because Russia, not the Soviet Union. But they still don't want you saying negative things about the Soviet Union. That's so weird. I guess so. I don't know. Uh, Kasparov said that this is like a new Putin thing. I mean, it, I guess it kind of makes sense because if you can kind of erase the atrocities and horrors that happened in the Soviet Union from Russian history, then I guess it's easier to commit them again. Um, yeah. I mean, that that would be my guess, I suppose. That's a good point. You can't say our government has always been this terrible. You can idealize the past, which is kind of what fascists do, right? They say, look, our proud history. But if you go, but weren't people just starving and put in gulags for political beliefs and da 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 da? And it's like, well, not if we say that didn't happen and you can't read about it anymore. It didn't. So we can idealize the past in a way that's like people idealize their ex-girlfriend and compare them to their current girlfriend to use a, a dating analogy, <laughs> which, right? Yeah, which my my ex-girlfriend wasn't a gulag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she wasn't that bad. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we don't have to censor the conversation. She was all right. I, I we 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 both married well. Uh, yeah, know, yeah. We, we, let's we not did. go down. I'm just going to get myself in trouble from here. All right. So, <laughs> so interesting. Your book is censored. Well, it's cool because it doesn't that make you think, wow, I have dangerous ideas, man. Even if it's just a historical anecdote, it's kind of a little claim to fame. I'm censored by Putin. Kind of cool. Yeah. I, I want to see a photo of him reading your book at that super long COVID table that he has. Yeah. Right. With nobody in the room with him. <laughs> right. With like a black Sharpie being like, no, nah, not this. Agree with the idea. Hate the example, Mark. Strike that one out. Yeah, but no, it, it is definitely a feather in my cap. Um, we, we've already used it for marketing purposes on the website. Great. Yeah, good. I love it. I love, to, I love to hear that. All right, so childhood, you grew up outside Austin, Bibles, football. I know you're not really into that. Um, you wore metal shirts and smoked pot and mouthed off to adults, probably, which is, you haven't changed a bit, by the way. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's not, not, not much evolution has happened, actually. No, a little <laughs> bit of personal growth, but all on the inside. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask about, I know you got arrested in middle school for weed, and what is, what is that like? You're just dis disappointing the shit out of your parents, probably yourself. I also, I got arrested for, I didn't get arrested, sorry, I got in deep trouble for so, uh, credit card fraud when I was like 13 because I ordered pizzas for the whole school. It's a story I think I've told on the show, but it was the same kind of outcome. You know, your parents just think like, you're such a fucking loser. Like, how did I ruin my child? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. I think back to that and I, as an adolescent, I was such like an eight, like just this little ball of anger. Um, when I was probably, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14. And I wasn't, I had no self-awareness around it. All I understood was that breaking rules 
was really gratifying. Like the more I upset a teacher or my parents, there was like a certain kind of like sick pride that came with that. And so there was probably like two years of me just pushing boundaries repeatedly and like seeing how much more I could get away with and how much more trouble I could get in. Um, yeah, there was something just strangely psychologically satisfying for me at that time. And I, it's probably because I was a miserable, you know, fucked up kid. Mm -hmm. uh, but when when that arrest happened, I don't know, I guess it was never part of my reality that that the legal system could actually get involved. And I think maybe there was always this like safety net in my mind of like, well, that that would never actually happen to me. Like all, all all these like laws that I'm skirting around and dipping my toe across, um, you know, nothing's actually going to happen. Uh, so when yeah, the police showed up and I was in handcuffs and ended up in a jail cell in a juvenile hall, it it was definitely a scared straight moment. It was like, oh shit, this this actually is life altering this i there there isn't the safety blanket around me that uh removes me from long term consequences uh and it was the first time i think you know i i went too far and that psychological satisfaction wasn't there it was actually quite the opposite it was kind of this like desperate like oh my god where are my parents like please come get me mm -hmm. <laughs> please help me <laughs> i didn't mean to go this far uh so yeah, it, it was, it was, it was a pretty rude wake up call, um, for everybody at that time. I mean, my, my family, people will see in the film, I talk about it in more detail than I do in the book, but it, it was, you know, my family on paper was very leave it to beaver. Like everything looked nice and was nice on paper and, but emotionally, everything was very dysfunctional and it was falling apart. And I was so young that I didn't really understand that. And, and so I was just acting out, you know, because I just had all this like emotion built up inside of me and I didn't know what to do with it. But, um, I think that arrest was part of the collapse of my, my family as an adolescent. And it, it, uh, it never really recovered when you say the collapse of your family, do you, I, mean, I know your parents got divorced a few months after the pot incident. You don't blame your, you don't blame yourself for that. Do you? No, no, it, it's, it's, I see all of those things. There were a number of things. My brother got in some legal trouble. I got in some legal trouble. Um, my parents had a bunch of shit going on. You know, it was, everything was the effect of, a, a central emotional cause, which was that there was just a fundamental dysfunction within the family. Like we, my parents didn't have a functional relationship. And so my brother and I didn't grow up with functional, emotionally functional role models. So we didn't have functional relationships with our parents. So it, we, you had four people who just didn't know how to relate or get along with each other in a healthy manner whatsoever. And so the you know my my arrest incident is just one of those things that was like the fallout of that it was it was downstream of that dysfunction speaking of emotions uh, in the film you talk about delusional positivity and that the idea that it's fashionable to believe things you want to believe just because those beliefs feel good and it kind of relates in a way to like I've done an episode on hustle culture and hustle porn, episode 682. I'd love to talk about this, this delusional positivity and why it's damaging. Because I've talked about it with the work context, sort of a business context. I'd love to hear your take on this from a personal relationships context. Because I, I do think that a lot of people, it's almost like if you don't have this, it's almost weird, especially online. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's persistent it's positivity is a tricky thing right because it is useful to have a positive mindset in many situations and many circumstances especially if you're if you're going through challenges or struggles like looking on the bright side it can be helpful but i think there's a difference between 
positivity as a tool, like you can use it as a tool to kind of help you get through a difficult period. And I think in that sense, it's a very useful tool. But I think a lot of people, they don't realize it's a tool. They treat it as like a way of life. They, they, they start doing it compulsively. And because they, they, it's not that they, like a healthy way to use a positive mindset is I'm going through some difficult stuff in my life. Let me take a moment and try to think of the things that I'm grateful for. Let me try to think of maybe the benefits or the lessons that could come from this, um, you know, to help me get through it, to help me learn from it. A unhealthy positivity or positive mindset would be, I'm going through some challenges. Let's just pretend those challenges don't exist because I don't want to deal with it. If I just keep telling myself everything's great, then I won't have to, it'll go away. I don't have to deal with it. I don't have to struggle with it. I don't have to, uh, you know, fail or feel rejected or anything. And so people who aren't able to face the negative, they develop a compulsive positivity. And the compulsive positivity on the surface looks nice. You're like, wow, that per that person is so happy. And they're always like, you know, happy go lucky and, and optimistic. But underneath the surface, they're like desperately trying to keep the darkness away. And the problem is, is to consistently keep that darkness away over a long period of time you have to start detaching yourself from reality. You have to literally start telling yourself that things, things that aren't there or things that are, that are there are not actually there, that they're mm -hmm. not true, they don't exist. And that once you reach that place, it will start interfering with your relationships. It will start interfering with your, your job, your profession, any hobbies you're pursuing. Because to improve anything whether it's a relationship or, or a pursuit or a career, you have to deal with reality. Like the way you learn and improve at something is you look at the reality, you say, how can this be better? And then you improve upon it. If, you, if you're refusing to look at the reality and you're just telling yourself it's great, then you're removing the opportunity for improvement and growth. Um, so that, that's kind of where the posit like positivity can become dysfunctional, it can become compulsive, and it can ironically keep people stuck in the same situation that they're, that they're in. Um, despite the fact that they're probably telling themselves all the time that they're having breakthroughs and growth and, Oh my God, I'm a new person and whatever. Yeah. It's interesting. I see a lot of self-help culty self-help seminars. They do that a lot, right? They'll get you really sort of psyched up and train you to, you can change your emotional state at the drop of a hat, which I'm sure is useful sometimes but can easily get abused by people who are like, oh, this, I need this. I need to change my emotional state at the drop of a hat because I find myself being really unhappy that I haven't dealt with the emotional baggage of watching my parents go through alcoholism, substance abuse, divorce, abuse, whatever, or being abused as a kid. So I'm just gonna change my state by jumping up and down and power posing. It's like, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe these negative emotions are there for a reason, and not that you deserve the punishment of having those emotions all the time, but maybe that they're indicating something. And you phrase this really well, I'm gonna paraphrase something from the movie here. You say, our brains want there to be a formula for happiness in, equ in equation, but there just isn't, no matter what we want to believe. Yeah, and it, it's, I think if you take somebody who has spent a long time feeling miserable and you kind of teach them to change their state in an instant, that can feel very powerful in that moment. And it can feel, I, I can understand why people feel like that is actually changing something. Like they feel like that's a, a breakthrough in their lives. Like I just spent two years being absolutely miserable and depressed. I went to this seminar, this super charismatic person came out on stage. They played a bunch of music and oh my God, I felt great for like two days. And I, I can't remember the last time I felt great for two days. I can understand why that, that is very significant for that person. But as you pointed out, it's one thing to change your emotion. It's another thing to actually look at the root causes of the negative emotion mm -hmm. and sort through it and actually deal with it. And I do think, you know, changing, learning to change your emotional state or getting into a better emotional state, it's probably useful for that process, you know, to go back and deal with all the baggage. But you, 
you have to be willing to go back to it. You can't just like, no, 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 I'm just going to play happy in this little bubble for the rest of my life and, <laughs> and keep signing up for seminars every weekend forever and ever, uh, you know, because God, I, I can't go back to that. And I think that's what a lot of people get sucked into. And this is, I talk about this a lot. I have a number of articles on my website that talk about this, but how it, self-help material can easily become another form of avoidance. You know, you can, there are plenty of people that you see, you know, go out and buy a book or watch a bunch of videos to solve some problem in their life. And, and it introduces all these interesting intellectual concepts and ideas to them. And they feel like they made some progress and they understand themselves better and they get a little bit of a high from that. And so they go out and buy another five books and download another seminar and spend another month like digging into this and learning new concepts. And, you know, they, they can go down a rabbit hole for months intellectualizing their problems. But until they actually behave differently in their day to day life, they haven't really changed. They haven't done anything. And so it's, it's, um, I've actually got, I've got a YouTube video coming out probably around the time this goes up. And I, and I say it, it's, it's learning often feels like progress, but it isn't always progress. And we can, learning is often a, the most seductive form of procrastination. Oh yeah. You know, we tell her, we tell ourselves, I need, I just need to learn a little bit more. Let me just study a little bit longer. Let me do a little bit more research and then I'll go address this issue that's been in my life for 10 years. Um, you know, it feels productive, but you're not actually changing anything. It's funny that that's an example. That's one of the prime things that we used to talk about back when you and I were doing the dating coach stuff, the pickup artist stuff, right? It was the guys who were like just reading field reports and just in the forums. And it's like, you have to go out. You have to go out and talk and approach women and approach strangers because if you don't, you're never going to, it's all just an intellectual circle jerk. So it's funny that this is like a prime example. That was, see, there is wisdom in the things that we were teaching and learning and doing back then. It was just all aimed at kind of in the wrong direction slash outward instead of inward. I, it's funny. I've been really coming around on this. Um, I, I, it's, it is amazing how much this stuff applies to in life. It's funny too. I remember the last year or so that I coached, I, I, I can't tell you how many, like the look of disappointment that I would see on my clients faces. I would, you know, they would hire me. I would take them out to a bar or something. We'd see a cute girl. I'd say, okay, go talk to her. And, and he'd be like, what's my line? What's the strategy tonight? And I'd be like, how about you say, hi, my name's John. And just the look of utter disappointment on their face of like, wait a second. I've been reading all this shit and studying this last year for this moment. And I could have just said, hi, I'm John the entire time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a there was a lot of like, but wait, but what's my what are my nonverbals doing when I introduce yeah, myself? And it's like, man, all of this intellectualization. Yeah, it's a. It, what's your refund policy, Mark? Uh, if yeah, this is, right. Is this, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have different stuff tomorrow <laughs> night, right? At the intro thing is just so we get used to. Yeah, uh, I get it. I I understand that these guys thought we had secret knowledge when really what we had was experience and we were going to force them to get experience. And that was half the value of what we were teaching at that time. Probably 90% of it. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, that rejection that you're so afraid of, I went through it and that's why yeah. you're paying me basically. Yeah. You're going to get 50 of those tonight. And then by tomorrow you're going to be like, God, this just wasn't that bad. I wish I'd done that three years ago. It could have saved $8,000 <laughs> <Right. laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. Tell me about negative emotions. You've got, in the movie, you discuss the hedonic treadmill and comparison, and I've, you know, I'll talk about a little bit about that stuff in the show close, but what do we do? You mentioned sitting with negative thoughts and emotions, like a, almost like a cross-training for your mind. Tell me about that. So I have this saying that I repeat often, which is that there's there's no such thing as a bad emotion. There's only bad reactions to emotions. Uh, it's one of the most common questions I get is, hey, Mark, this thing in my life happened. 
and I feel X, where X is, you know, either anger, sadness, depression, shame, guilt. How do I stop feeling X? Like what's, what's wrong? What did I do wrong? And my response, <laughs> again, coming back to the disappoint, disappointing clients, uh, or maybe I'm, maybe I am the disappointment panda, but my response is always like, you didn't do anything wrong. You're supposed to feel sad or guilty or anger. Like, of course you feel guilty. Like this fucking thing happened. That's an awful thing. Like you should feel guilty. Uh, and then obviously they get very disappointed because that's not what they want to hear. But to me, and, this is a very liberating idea that sure, it, it's the negative emotions are supposed to happen. Like even, even though they, you don't like them and you wish they would go away, they are helping you. You know, that guilt is, is better preparing you for the next situation to not fuck up. You know, that anger is motivating you to take action and, and change something in your life. Um, you know, that sadness is honoring something that was important to you and feels lost. Um, and so I think it's important to be able to, you know, you have to be able to sit with those negative emotions to find what is valuable in them. And then that allows you to move forward from them, to have that, have that good reaction from the negative emotion. And so that's kind of what I mean by like emotional cross training. You know, obviously we all like to feel good. We all like being happy. Happiness is easy. Like happiness is so fucking easy. Nobody, nobody ever emails me saying, Mark, I'm so happy. I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, it's like, help me out here. Why am yeah. I happy? Why, why, how do I stop being happy? Nobody asks that question. Happiness, happiness is easy. You know, the, the things that we struggle with is, is this poo poo platter of negative emotions. And, you know, some of us, I think I, what I find is that some people tend to naturally be better at managing some emotions like some people are naturally very good at managing their anger but they're terrible with guilt and then there are other people who are tend to naturally be pretty good at managing their their shame and guilt but man they they really get sad sometimes and like just feel like down and down in the mud um and so i think a lot of it is just understanding like which which emotions do you in particular struggle with and and consciously sitting with it to work on finding the positive reactions to it. Yeah, I think in, in the movie you said something along the lines of happiness doesn't come from getting rid of problems, it comes from solving your problems. And that's the only way to do that is to take a lesson from the negative emotion in some way. And look, I, I wanna be clear, if somebody's like depressed for months on end, or even weeks, definitely get therapy, even if you're not feeling it for weeks on end, get therapy, it's healthy for you. Don't feel shame if you need medication for something. We're talk I assume you're not talking about a medical diagnosis of somebody having, no. you know, anger or depression issues. We're not talking, like, just sit with it. It's only been a few years, you'll be fine, you'll come out the other side. Like, some people need medical intervention, whether that's medicine or, or talk therapy or both. Yeah, well, one of, one of the things I, I, I talk about on my website is, uh, and in my courses is I say, look, I, I am your expert for mild life problems, like serious, serious life problems, you know, like a, a serious mental health episode, um, major, major trauma, you know, that I'm not, I'm not your guy. You should go see a professional and, and spend a lot of time with that professional. But if you've got a breakup, if you have a midlife crisis, if you just got laid off your job that you really liked and you don't know what to do with yourself, um, you know, if you, if your mom drives you crazy and you don't know how to manage that relationship, like I'm your guy, that's what I'm here for. Like mild life problems, uh, or I guess you could say high quality life problems. I, I think that's fair and responsible. Uh, I would agree. You know, Feedback Friday, our advice shows, some, there's a lot of people who write in and they have really serious stuff and we're like, oh, you, you absolutely need a medical intervention, possibly slash probably medication. We don't even air those. You know, we send them a nice response with some resources. It, it, it's really easy for people in our position to be, to suddenly start believing, or maybe not even suddenly, over time, start believing that they can fix anything because we don't hear when we truly screw somebody up over time, right? We, so we just start to believe that we're geniuses because, well, after all, I've sold 16 million books internationally or I've had, 
you know, 300 million downloads of my show in the past few years, I must know what I'm doing. It's like, well, the scoreboard doesn't always dictate the quality of service uh, yeah. on this particular, on this stuff. I do like your take, though, on, on not always being able to trust positive emotions. Tell me about that. I think this is very insightful. Well, so the same way that there's always, you can always, you can find value in negative emotions. You can actually find, you can find ways for positive emotions to, to trick you or hurt you. Um, it's, we have a tendency when something makes us feel good, we tend to convince ourselves or lie to ourselves that it, it must be a good thing. And this can get us into trouble. I mean, the, the most obvious example of this is, is say substance addiction, right? Like it's, it makes you feel great. So you start rationalizing and coming up with reasons to do it more often, why it's not interfering with your life. You start telling your friends and family like, no, 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 it's under control. Everything's fine. You know, like that, that, that is an extreme example of how feeling good can actually lead you astray. And mm -hmm the importance of being skeptical of things that make you feel good. Uh, and so even though that's, that's an extreme example, I think that same principle plays out in a lot of different ways. Like just because something is like, I'll tell you this, Jordan, the most fun job I ever had in my life, I was a bike messenger for six months, uh, my senior year of college. And Where? I, Where was in this? Boston. Oh God, that's so dangerous. Yeah, no, looking back, I'm like, I'm so glad my brain is intact. Like I, <laughs> and like, You're so all the guys lucky. I, yeah. Uh. All, all the guys I worked with, like were hospitalized at some point. Um, but it, it's, I love that job. Like it was so much fun. I made no money. I was probably going to kill myself at some point. Um, you know, just getting hit by a car or getting hit in traffic. Uh, but it, it was, I honestly, I, that is the only job like, you know, I don't really count what I do as a job, but like that was the only job I've ever had in my life that I woke up every day. Like I couldn't wait to get on that bike and yeah, horrible career choice, horrible, horrible, horrible career choice. <laughs> I was like, so I, I never, I never considered pursuing it as a career. Um, but it, it just like, that is a perfect example of like, just cause you like something, you know, and you hear all, you see all these cliches on Instagram and stuff like, Oh, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. It's like, well, I love bike messaging, but I would probably be a, 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 a spot on the road of, <laughs> of mass Ave in, in Boston right now, if I, right. if I didn't give up the job that I love. So it's, you need to think critically about, both sides of the equation. Think critically about the negative emotions, but also think critically about the, the positive emotions. I, I see this, well, we're way off my notes, but who cares? Uh, I see this trend happening a lot with escapism, especially now that people can work from anywhere. I see a lot of digital nomads, and I've got this sort of whole rant I've done on the show, I'm sure, way too many times about how I'll never hire these people, except for one who's my video editor. He actually gets his work done. But a lot of these people, they can't, they can't really hold it together. And one of the reasons I think is, I think there's a, I think a majority or at least a fair percentage of people who are doing the digital nomad thing are truly just escaping from something. Yes. And they're chasing positive feelings are literally around the world and reinventing themselves. And some of that can be healthy. Look, go for it, man. Study abroad or work abroad, reinvent yourself a few times. But at some point, if you're moving every time you have a close relationship, you set up close relationships or you get to know a place, there's something there, man. And I, I'm wondering about your take on this because this, this seems like something you would have either thought about and or you have an opinion on. I really do uh, well, feel like I, these people are running. And I, well, I was a digital nomad for six years. So, oh, yeah, the Brazil thing where you met your, your lovely wife. Um, yeah, but I, I, was an, I was a nomad two and a half years before I met her. So, so I, I will say this. First of all, I don't think you're wrong. My experience with with nomads, with nomad culture and meeting nomads, and and is that you you get all sorts of extremes. So you tend to find really, really digital nomads are either very interesting people, uh, or they're just running away from something. And so it's, I'd say it's probably seventy five percent are are running away. Yeah. 
that said, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like some, some of them, like I look back at my motivations for living that lifestyle. I think I was young. I was in my twenties. I was single. It was like, when else am I going to have this chance to like go live in Asia, or go learn another language? Um, so in that sense, I don't regret that. Like I see that as a valuable investment of my time and energy up to probably around year three or four. I would say once you hit year three or four, the diminishing returns kick in. Like you've been to enough countries, you've been to enough like tourist sites and seen enough cultures and you're not really getting a whole lot out of it anymore. And at that point, you should probably just go home. And it took me another couple of years to finally accept that and go home. But I would say the first two to three years were, were actually were very, very valuable for me. But kind of back to the people that I met and noted and saw, I generally found like the people who were running away from something, it was either it was either because they were doing some shady shit. Oh, yeah. um, they, they were, you know, I met guys who were selling penis pills. I met guys who were hacking credit card databases and reselling them like really oh, wow. shady shady dudes who were the re they were in the third world for a reason because they could they would be arrested if they were anywhere else um <laughs> and so obviously you avoid those people there's kind of another class of guys who as you pointed out are just lazy like they don't really care about thai culture or thai cuisine they're in thailand because it's cheap and nobody bothers them and they can work three hours a day and like pay for their apartment. Like that's basically why they're there. And they haven't thought about, you know, what's going to happen when I'm 30 or 35 and want to get, start a family or buy a house or whatever. Like they, they're just kind of irresponsibly lazy. But then I'd say the, the, that the minority of people who are driven and smart, tend to be super interesting, like very outside the box thinkers, very entrepreneurial, fascinating people. And, um, and, and just kind of totally comfortable, like, you know, okay, this is going to be my new culture. You know, I'm in Colombia, or like what I did with Brazil. Like I, I met my wife and I was like, okay, I guess I'll learn Portuguese and live here for a few years. And that's what I did. And it was really challenging, but I enjoyed that challenge. Like it was a very intellectually stimulating challenge. I enjoyed learning about the culture. Um, and so I think for those people, it's, there does seem to be kind of a legitimate reason um, or like that. That's just how, like they're just super curious people and being a digital nomad is just another way to kind of fulfill that curiosity. Yeah, you, you know, I, I sort of I have to take a bite out of my own point here because traveling was so important to my development as well. I think the problem is I just met so many people that were addicted to it and they they didn't settle in one place and stay there for three years. They went to a new place every few weeks or every few months. And it really seemed like an unhealthy desire to try to become something extraordinary, but then not really have the know-how to do it, but feel all the psychological pressure that they needed to do it from social media or wherever, and then try to do that, start that process over and over again. And they, I could almost smell the disappointment on these people when they'd show up to a place, and I think it's a Mark Twain quote, well, although everything is, right? But wherever you go, there you are. They'd show up and they'd have the same set of problems and bad beliefs and the same set of issues that they had at the last place, and eventually this new place, it would all, the novelty would wear off, it would sink in and they'd be like, ah, screw it, I'm going to Israel now because there is where my ideal life is. That's where I'm going to meet the special person and the person who's going to fix me and the environment that's going to welcome me and change me. Yeah, you definitely run into people who are just perpetually dissatisfied with their environment and the people around them. And I'm trying to think if I was like that a little bit. I mean. I, I would definitely happen with me at a certain point is you just realize that every place has its problems. Like you're kind of just picking and choosing, you know, I think before I was a nomad, I, I had some naive beliefs about the United States and about other countries and cultures, but by being a nomad, it, it dispelled a lot of 
a lot of those naive naive beliefs, both about the U.S. and about other places in the world. And you, eventually, you just kind of realize that like every place has serious problems. Like every mm -hmm. place has great things about their culture and their history and uh, and their society, but every place has serious problems. And those problems aren't all necessarily symmetrical. Like there are better and worse trade-offs. Like this is, it's funny. So when I first moved to Latin America, I was like, yeah, you know, the buses don't run on time and maybe somebody steals your phone every once in a while, but people are so emotionally open. They're very authentic. They're very honest with each other. Like, and for somebody who grew up in a very kind of emotionally constricted environment and family, my first couple of years in Latin America was it, honestly, it was very therapeutic. Like being there, I think made me a more integrated and complete person because being around people who are so comfortable with their emotions, uh, helped me become more comfortable with my emotions and expressing myself and sharing my thoughts and ideas with others. But after a certain amount of time, and especially once I got engaged to my wife and we started thinking about kids buying a house, uh, schools, you know, basically starting a, a, a long-term life, you look at Brazil and you look at the, at the U S and you're like, okay, this isn't really a question anymore. Like the, these are not equivalent choices or, or options. So I think on a surface level, like if, if you're just kind of going to go experience a culture temporarily, it, it's almost like trying on new clothes. You're like, Oh cool. I'll go try on this culture for a few months and see how it feels. But as soon as you start thinking about long-term life planning, there are better and worse places to live in the world. And you, at some point you have to commit to one. That's true. Yeah. I like, wow, this traffic is always going to be like that. This air pollution is always going to be this way, or this crime is possibly going to get worse. That kind of thing. Yep. You start thinking about raising kids and where you're going to live. And it's like, oh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be maximizing the number of experiences that I'm having when I'm 35 and have babies yeah. or 45 and have babies. It's you, you hit it completely. Like the, 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 the thing that flipped the switch for me when I decided to marry my wife and we started talking about kids, like our friends in Brazil, they have bulletproof cars. They have kidnapping insurance for their kids. Like their, their kids go to private schools with barbed wire fences around them so that people can't get in. Um, you know, so as soon as like, as soon as that, that switch flipped and I started thinking about, oh shit, if I have kids, is it going to be here? No fucking way. It's going to be here. <laughs> We're going to go back to the States and all those things that I complained about in my twenties about the U S like, no, nope, I can live with that. That's fine. <laughs> I've got a, a show fan from Brazil who's going to California. She wrote me on Instagram and I, she said, Oh, I'm going to stay in Venice. And I said, Oh, you know, be careful. It's a little bit of a dodgy area. And she's, I, I can't remember her exact response, but it was something along the lines of I'm from Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> I was like, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah you'll they, be fine. <laughs> yeah. You, 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 <laughs> you cannot imagine right. the things that she has seen. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just, I, I realized kind of how dumb, it was. but you know, you don't want somebody from another country to have a bad experience in the United States by getting mugged or something, you know, it's like a beautiful athletic woman is just going to like probably going to walk around downtown by herself. I'm like, Oh, you better, you know, it's a little bit of a, it can be a little rough around the edges. Don't let the beach fool you. Uh, yeah. Her response was pretty, pretty funny. If memory serves, uh, I I'd love to talk about the self-esteem movement. You talk about this in the movie, how the self-esteem movement kind of created a generation of entitled people, but you had a different take on it than, than a lot of the boomer takes where it's like, yeah, the self, everybody gets a blue ribbon. You need to learn how to lose. <laughs> it, your, your take was a little more insightful. I think, you know, I think the self-esteem movement had good intentions. I just think it got a little bit mixed up in the process. So to give, give everybody a quick primer, you know, self-esteem emerged as a concept in the 60s. And it's interesting. So Nathaniel Brandon, who's the, the guy who kind of originated the, the term self-esteem, if you go back and like read his book, Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, the original conceptualization of it is actually very, very good. It, he, it's, very, it's also very nuanced. It's not just about how you feel about yourself, but it's, it's kind of how you see your identity. Do you see yourself, even if you don't feel great about yourself today, 
do you think you are a resilient person? Do you think you are able to handle setbacks? Um, do you tend to bounce back from things? Like the, it, it's a much more nuanced definition of self-esteem than what kind of ended up being measured and researched in, in the academic literature in the following decades, which was essentially just asking people, how do you feel about yourself? Do you like yourself? And it turns out that that's not a great way to define self-esteem because so early research on self-esteem, it, it, it basically found that people with high self-esteem, basically people who like themselves or feel good about themselves tend to do better in all these categories. They make better grades at school. They get better jobs. They make more money. They commit less crime. They, uh, you know, whatever they give more to charity. I don't know. There's like dozens and dozens of measurements that say that self-esteem helps. And so there was kind of this revolution in the seventies, a, a hard push towards policy of like, we need to give kids self-esteem, you know, like you, we need to start making kids feel better about themselves in school. And so this is when you start seeing great inflation and participation trophies and mm -hmm. all, all that stuff that, uh, you know, your parents and my parents gripe about. And, um, <laughs> and it's funny because it's, I think what what people didn't realize, there was an, a set of studies that came out in the 2000s by a guy named Roy Baumeister. And oh, it, yeah. he was really, it was really clever what he did. He was like, you know, people are so obsessed with, so obsessed with measuring self-esteem in schools and colleges and workplaces. Let me go to prison. Let's go see like what, how, how violent criminals feel about themselves. And so he went to like maximum security prisons and ran these self-esteem surveys on the prisoners. And it turned out that not only did violent criminals have really high self-esteem, <laughs> their self-esteem was like off the charts. Like, sure. <laughs> like their self-esteem was like, you know, through the roof. And they, they should have been like CEOs of a Fortune 500 company. They felt so good about themselves. So it kind of like this, this reckoning happened over to, has been happening over like the last 10 or 15 years of, you know, maybe we weren't defining it correctly. Maybe we should be a little bit more nuanced. Um, but I, to me, the takeaway here is that when people, just because you feel good about yourself, like, okay, if you are a helpful, productive person in society, it makes sense that you feel good about yourself because you're you're helping your community and you're being productive. So of course you feel good about yourself. But if you look at people who are destructive and like fucking things up, usually the thing the way that they justify that to them, to themselves is because they feel good about themselves. So it's it, self-esteem can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. It can it it can exist for a good reason, but it can also be used to justify all sorts of entitled selfish crap. And I, I worry that this emphasis on self-esteem on, you know, you and I's generation when we were growing up, making us feel good about ourselves all the time, it, it prevented us from, you know, again, coming back to being focused on reality. It, it, it kind of trained us to develop that compulsive positivity about our self-image of like, yeah. well, I'm, I'm supposed to be special and mom and dad say that I'm, I can be anything I want and I'm supposed to be great. You know, so uh, it must be my teacher's fault that I got an F on my exam. You know, she hates me obviously. And so it develops this like sense of, of entitlement and, and, you know, selfishness that maybe wasn't necessarily there before. Um, and so I, I just think a much, and I say this in the book, but a much healthier evaluation of self-esteem isn't how you feel about the good aspects about yourself. It's, it's how you feel about the negative aspects about yourself because entitled people refuse to believe that there's anything negative about themselves. They, they like, they just can't see it. They've like blinded themselves to it. Whereas a healthy self-esteem would be saying like, okay, well, here are my strengths and those are great, but here are my weaknesses and I'm working on them. And you know, let's, let's be aware of those and watch out for them. Um, to me, that would be a healthy definition of self-esteem, but the way it's been measured throughout the decades is just like, do you like yourself? Do you think <laughs> you're good, you know? And it's, well, every, you know, it's not hard to get people to think that. 
it seems like that would damage our psyche, right? Because it's a protective mechanism and it's, well, it's a delusional belief that in a way it removes us from who we really are because you're removing, you're trying to remove your limitations. You're telling yourself how special and unique you are, probably convincing yourself that you're misunderstood or, or you know, nobody understands how good I am at this or how great I, I'm supposed to be other than my parents maybe. It, and it protects us from facing the pain well, of reality, of our current situation, or or situations we're going to face in the future, certainly. Yeah, I mean, and this is what compulsive positivity does in all of its forms, is it removes the opportunity for growth. Like, if you're not willing to admit where your shortcomings are, then you can't grow from those shortcomings. You can't learn and improve upon them. And as we talked about earlier, growth is what drives happiness. Grow, it's, it's that experience of surmounting obstacles and challenges that drives a sense of satisfaction and happiness in our life. So if you are denying any of your shortcomings, you're removing your opportunity for growth, you're actually removing your opportunity for stable long-term happiness. You basically, you, you turn yourself into an addict, somebody who needs to find new stimulation all the time to cover up, to, to help cover up uh, the shortcomings that you don't want to face. And so whether it's travel or substance abuse or, you know, scrolling TikTok for seven hours straight, like it's, you, you're going to find something to, to keep the darkness at bay. <laughs> I feel seen, uh, by the way, great, <laughs> <laughs> great definition of entitlement from the film. Uh, again, paraphrasing, feeling like you deserve something without having to pay the cost of it. And I think in the movie, you're not talking necessarily about literally having to earn money to buy something, for example, or even working towards a goal. Some of that is, of course, working towards an outcome, but a lot of it is just simply feeling emotional discomfort, perhaps, from going through something like growth and, and feeling like you should have the result without having to do that in the first place. Yeah, it's not just it's not just financial work. It's, you know putting in the work of having the difficult conversations to make a relationship work. Like you can't make a relationship, like a relationship's not going to work if you don't talk about uncomfortable things with some regularity. Um, you know, that that's just that. And, and again, you run into the situation where people, you know, push away uncomfortable conversations, push them away, push them away, push them away for years. And then all of a sudden they wake up one day and it's like the, their partner, like they don't love each other anymore. They feel completely distant. They don't know who we, know each other. And they ask themselves, they're like, well, wow, wow, we seemed so happy. Where did I go wrong? And it's like, well, yeah, because happiness isn't the hard part. Like it's easy to, it's easy to have pleasant conversations with somebody. Like you could do that anytime you want. The, the difficulty is to actually deal with the uncomfortable stuff because that is that's what needs to be handled and that's what also generates the sense of intimacy between two people you mentioned avoidance i would love to work in manson's law of avoidance as you and by the way congrats on coming up with an idea and then naming it after yourself that really hits home <laughs> for me here on the jordan harbinger show uh soon to be a book <laughs> with the same title uh, not really yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, your, your table of, your table of contents should be the Jordan Harbinger chapter one, the yes. first Jordan Harbinger chapter, the second Jordan Harbinger chapter. I'm not. Yeah, I'm just gonna not even try to make anything descriptive uh, if I ever come up with anything. We, we, I did. Can you believe I didn't need a ghostwriter for this? I wrote the whole thing myself. Um, people, the idea that people will avoid something in proportion to how much that thing threatens their worldview. This is actually super insightful. I, I want to. I want to work in the Japanese soldier story that you tell in the movie, because one, it's fascinating and I've never heard it anywhere else. I've, you know, I've heard a little like urban legend version of it, but I think it's so insightful. And I think a lot of us do this in our lives uh, in a less extreme way. Well, I, I think I came up with Manson's law of avoidance because I, I was super fascinated at the time of how people don't just avoid, uh, People don't just avoid experiences that could have a negative impact on their lives. People also seem to avoid experiences that could have a positive impact on their lives. They like they if you think about your anxiety levels, they are actually quite proportional between something you think something that scares you and something that could actually change your life 
very positively. It also kind of freaks you out a little bit and you resist it and you sabotage yourself. And so I think I was kind of looking like, what is the common thread there? And whether positive or negative, the common thread is these are both events that threaten the change how you see yourself, mm -hmm. threaten the change how you are. Whether it's a negative event that threatens the change how you see yourself in a very upsetting and uncomfortable way, or a positive event that threatens to change how you see yourself uh, in a way that you know opens up new opportunities, but also raises new questions of like, do I deserve this? Uh, did I earn this? In my, you know, it's basically another way of saying that like anything outside of our comfort zone will will strike us as terrifying regardless of whether it's growth or dis destructive um so i i i think it's important to understand that because it's again kind of setting expectations people i think it's it, it's a, it's a it says a lot about the self-help industry that i think a lot of people have adopted this assumption that change and growth is is like it's like a holiday. It's like a picnic, you know, like mm -hmm. it's going to be euphoric. Like you're going to raise your arms and you're going to cry and you're going to scream and you're going to sway and hug strangers. Like it's that, that view of self-transformation I think is very inaccurate because w what actual growth looks like is that it's really fucking scary and difficult. And even when you're on the other side of it, you're not totally certain you made it. <laughs> you're like, wait a second. It, it, am I really on the other side of this or am I about to fuck up and fall back in? Um, so there's a lot of self-doubt and insecurity that comes along with it as well. And so I, I think it's important to have a realistic perspective on that because if you're not prepared for those negative, you know, the negative emotions that come with a breakthrough or come with uh, a certain amount of growth, then you're you know, you're going to fall back into avoidance and, and, you know, pushing everything down. Yeah. I think when I look at my top experiences of growth or things that led to the top experiences of growth, a lot of them were pretty unpleasant, right? Business falling apart, a relationship falling apart, uh, not getting into a program you thought you were going to get into or getting laid off from a job and then starting a business as a result and having that not work out right away or for a long time. It very, I can't even, th I'm really can't even think of an example where I, where I grew a lot from something and it was just all sunshine and rain. But even my exchange year where I lived overseas in high school and I, that was, that's the first six months of that were kind of terrible, really. It's I mean, hard. I look back it's on them, hard as shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, this like, you look back on it fondly cause you're like, yeah, man, I was, I remember and then I got robbed and then I like, I couldn't learn the language and then I got lost and I had to spend the night outside. You look at it now and you're like, oh, that was fun. But really, at the time, it's, it was terrible. It was horrible, and you wanted to go home, and you're maybe crying, and you couldn't sleep at night, and you had no friends or whatever it was, maybe all of those things, especially when you're living abroad. But that's the stuff that makes the... That makes it... That's the stuff that pushes you through the fire at the end of the day, or it is the fire. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting because it's... You know, I, I sometimes I ask people, I say, okay, write out, like, the three happiest moments of your life. Now write out the three most impactful moments of your life, like the three most influential or defining moments of your life. And it's interesting because for most people, those, those events are not, it's not the same events on each list. Usually it's the happiest events are like my wedding, yeah. uh, the birth of my child, like whatever. And then the, the most impactful, it's usually two out of three at least are extremely painful and difficult experiences. Yeah. And, and it's, I think it's, it's, it's just useful to, there, there's like this constant tension between happiness and meaning. Like it's, you need a certain amount of struggle and suffering in your life to feel a sense of growth. And that sense of growth leads to a sense of, of meaning and satisfaction, which ultimately leads to happiness. But you can't just stay at that happiness. You need to go back to the struggle and the challenge so you can get that next sense of growth and you get this cycle going. And, you know, so there's like this constant tension going on in our brains. If you just have all happiness all the time with no struggle or no challenge, it feels empty and meaningless. It feels, you know, it feels very pointless. Whereas if you have all struggle and challenge with no, with no happiness or no overcoming, you fall into despair. So you need, 
you need to kind of like go through this cycle, repeat, like fi find a flywheel, an emotional flywheel of um, surmountable challenges in your life that can <laughs> keep keep the wheel of happiness spinning. I just mixed like four metaphors I like together. It. No, I like, I'm the king of, of terrible metaphors and people are like, so the chicken is swimming now and then you're teaching a man how to fish. I don't, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Plenty of that on the Correct. show. Plenty of that. You're in the right place. You're in good company here. Um, I know you've only got a few minutes. I'd love to, to wrap up. I mentioned the Japanese soldier in the jungle. Really interesting, non-parable, very true story but that is caused by our desire to have certainty as humans. Do we have time for that, you think? Sure. I mean, I can give the quick version, you know, yeah. and, and pe people should Google this guy if they haven't. No, they should go see the fucking movie. I was going to say, you should, you should probably <laughs> plug your movie. I don't want to tell you how to do this, this whole media tour thing. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I should probably, should probably plug it. Um, so in the movie, you know, we, we do this really cool animated sequence about Hiro Noto, who was a Japanese soldier in World War II, and he got stranded on a remote island in the Philippines during the war. And so when the war ended, he, he wasn't aware that the war was finished. And he was, he had basically, I think he enlisted when he was 17 years old. He had his entire adult life, he had been spent fighting for the empire. And so when they finally dropped leaflets into the jungle to find the last holdouts of Japanese soldiers, and he saw them saying that the war had ended, you know, seven, eight years ago, he didn't believe him. He thought it was American propaganda and he like vowed to keep fighting. And he's in the and jungle of what, the Philippines or something like that? Like he's deep in the jungle. In deep the middle in the of, jungle. And, yeah. and he's still, he's like doing guerrilla warfare operations. So he's like shooting farmers and peasants and setting fields on fire. Like he's just being a real piece of shit for, for years and years and years. Like we're talking eight, 10 years at this point. So they start sending out search parties looking for him, but he's like so good at hiding, nobody actually finds him. They even at one point they get they get his brother to come out and start calling and saying the war is over, you need to come home. And his immediate thought is, wow, the Americans captured my brother and they can they they're like using him against me. And so he, he it ended up taking him 27 years to finally come out of the jungle. I think he he was the last Japanese holdout and he came out, I think, in 1972. And he's just a fascinating guy because it, he's fascinating in just how unnuanced he of a thinker he was. Like <laughs> he, he he went in he went into the war with like a very black and white. These are the bad guys. I'm the good guy. This is what I'm gonna do. And it's you know nothing's gonna stop me. You know, and and again on paper those if you're looking at it from a purely productivity point of view this guy's amazing like dude he fought a war on his own for 27 years hiding in the jungle like that's incredible like the amount yeah, of motivation dedication um self-assurance discipline required to do all those things but because he wasn't uh mentally flexible enough to take in new information, reconsider his prior assumptions, reconsider his values, what he found important, what he believed to be true. Uh, he actually ended up wasting most of his life uh, on, on this very destructive thing. And so it's, he, for me, he's like a cautionary tale of like, you can have all the productivity in the world. You can have the best habits in the world. You can have all like, like set out a ton of goals and fucking knock out those goals every single year. But if you don't have, if you are not aligned with the right values and you're not willing to question and alter those values as time goes on and as circumstances change, you're, you're going to, you're going to be lost in the jungle for decades. You're going to, mm -hmm. you're going to waste away decades. See, that was a good metaphor. You can do this, Mark. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you can it's do like it. A, it's almost like I'm a writer or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, look, the, the beauty of writing is you can just like change it or go like i need to sit on this until it makes sense podcasting you don't have that luxury man you're just <laughs> swimming in the ocean teaching a man how to fish running that last mile alone <laughs> or something <laughs> something like that yeah yeah uh you're this guy what was his name again the japanese Hiro soldier Onoda. Yeah, yeah it's it, it is incredible because he took 
all of these events and all of these things that were happening, right? The police are after him, the military is after him, his own brother's like yelling in a microphone or a loudspeaker through the jungle. They're dropping leaflets. They're trying to find this guy to essentially rescue him, but also to stop him from shooting random farmers and robbing them for no reason because he can go home. He's reframing all of these events to fit the worldview that he is so certain of, right? That the war is still going on, that the Japanese empire is going to prevail versus adjusting his worldview with new information. And it seems like we do, we do this a lot in smaller ways. It's just really obvious to us when somebody's doing it, uh, launching guerrilla warfare in the jungle with their, their comrades or, or alone, like this guy was, that it's the wrong course of action. But when we do it at work or in our relationships or with our friends or in our home life, it's, it's harder to detect. Yeah, it's, it's, I think I, I love using extreme stories because in extreme, like two reasons, really one is extreme stories grab and hold people's attention, but also because the principles in those stories are so, so clear. Like you, this guy, you, you read this story and you, you think this guy must've been absolutely crazy, but what you don't realize is that we all do this to a certain extent. Like how many times in your life have multiple people come to you and said, Hey man, you're wrong about this. You should change your mind on this. And you're like, ah, he's against me too. Oh man, he's in on it. Like none of these people get it. They're all lined against me. Maybe they're talking to each other, you know, like it's, it, it's in many ways, it's kind of our instinctual reaction to, uh, people who contradict us or challenge us in some ways. And so it's, it's very, very difficult to, uh, lower our guard and be willing to ask ourselves like, wait a second, am I like this Anoda guy in the jungle right now? Like assuming my brother is, <laughs> is being used by the counterintelligence, uh, you know, or am I, or am I the asshole basically? Right. Um, you know, right. So, so instead of looking for certainty, maybe we, what do we do? Look for, look for the doubt. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I, I, I use that question facetiously a moment ago, but it's actually something I use in my own life a lot when I'm thinking about difficult situations or problems. I always ask, am I the asshole here? Like, am I the crazy one? Like, what, what would it look like if I was the one who's a little bit delusional here? And then I kind of run that thought experiment through my head. And yeah, sometimes you're like, yeah, I think, I think I'm the asshole. I think it's me. Mark Manson, thank you so much. What's the, where can people see the movie? Because it was actually this was a question until a few weeks ago. I think that you didn't even know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other story. Uh, so the the film is available uh, on demand streaming services, so Amazon Prime, YouTube, iTunes. Oh, good. Um, and, and it should hopefully be coming to a larger streaming platform soon. I mean, YouTube is a decent sized streaming platform. Amazon Prime also. I feel like is a reasonable yeah, size. Yeah, but I, I mean, I mean, like free, you know, like included. Oh, got it. So you're like, you, you really, hey, don't pay for it. Wait till it comes out for free somewhere. <laughs> uh, oh, or just Google the guy. Don't watch my movie. You are really selling it's, it. It's, NBC is going to so, love this. It's, it's so good that Universal is not on this call right now. Yeah, I don't know why they sat this one out. Uh, maybe because they know we know each other. But yeah, if they were here, they'd be like. Cut, cut. But, yeah, that's a really good, yeah. You know, I do, whenever publicists are on the call, I always get an email afterwards. Can you cut the part about where he just suggested everyone Google it and or wait for the free version to come out? But uh, look, it's worth it's worth paying a few bucks to see it. I really enjoyed it, man. I'm super happy for your success. I'm proud to be your friend. I'm really, really excited for to, to see this next, uh, your your movie career takeoff. Uh, oh, you're going to be in the next Avengers. People don't maybe know yeah. that. It's not true at all. Um, but hey, man, really, really happy to talk to you today. I know you're probably going to do a bunch of these, like you said, but I, I thought this was a lot of fun. And uh, I'm going to make up a ridiculous metaphor in the show close to commemorate this experience that we just had here. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Um, you know, as a wise man once said, it's the turtle on the pond that wins the fastest slow race. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. 
in the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.